right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Women's Health Tech Wednesdays. My name is Nina Joshi, and I am very excited about our guest today, Kiran Surya Devara, Director of Product Management at Room Labs. Uh, just a little bit of background on Kiran. She comes from a clinical background and has made the transition to product. So during this episode, we are going to learn more about her journey and also learn a little bit more about what a transition like that looks like and how teams can incorporate more clinical insight into their product development. We love audience questions. So if you have any, please write them below and we will try to get to it at the end of our uh, time together. And so with that, I would like to welcome Kieran. Hi, Kieran. Thanks so much for being here today. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to be here today. Awesome. All right. Well, to kick things off, would love if you can uh, share with us a little bit more about your background and kind of your journey into healthcare. Yeah. So um, as Nina mentioned, I'm uh, director of product management at Rune Labs. Um, I started my career in clinical pharmacy, uh, went to pharmacy school, um, and then practiced um, in hospital pharmacy for the early part of my career out of New York City uh, with a large focus on oncology pharmacy. Um, I did that for about five years, and it was really important for me to get grounded in the clinical space and understand not just, um, you know, the drugs and diseases that I learned, but also how it's applicable in the real world um, across different patient populations. Um, and in retrospect, learning about workflow and how different groups interact um, both with each other in the hospital and also with technology within these um, health organizations also you know, provided a lot of insight for my later in life uh, projects. Um, but from there, I made a transition um, into um, what I now know as early stage startups um, in a largely clinical operations role um, mm -hmm. working under a clinical officer. So a good transition from uh, standard uh, everyday pharmacy into uh, the technology world. Um, and then sort of made my way into the product management um, verticals uh, and uh, was exposed to a lot of engineers and product managers very early on in that phase of my career um, and sort of uh, thought it was in a, a place where I could bring a lot of my skill sets from my clinician days. Um, mm -hmm. And just the last couple of years, been to a couple of organizations um, across the um, the healthcare ecosystem, so customers ranging from pharma all the way to payer, um, and now in the uh, clinician uh, and patient space. Um, so there I am. <laughs> That's quite a journey. Um, would love to learn. You know, you you really um, kind of gone through like the entire transition. Would love to learn a little bit more about. You know, was there a specific um, moment that you kind of recognized where you wanted to work outside of the clinical setting? Was it maybe a goal that you've had for some time? would love if you can share a little bit more about, you know, what the motivator was. Yeah, so um, I think anyone that I went to pharmacy school with would say that they um, didn't see me in pharmacy for a long time. I had a lot of interest going into pharmacy school. I thought I wanted to go to law school, um, somehow end up in like public health or health policy. Um, and then once I started practicing, after mm -hmm. getting the itch, starting to explore whether I wanted to go into public health, was talking to, you know, a couple programs and some folks in in the space and realized that that wasn't really how I wanted to make my impact. Um, I saw, mm -hmm. I was working at um, some really great organizations, um, hospitals in New York City, and there was a lot of disparities in the type of care that I knew I was providing at the Columbia's and the Memorial Sloan Kettering's versus some of the city hospitals um, that are just you know down on the island. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to really understand where I can make a larger impact with you know my very targeted skill set. Um, so I didn't know what that meant. I had some friends that recommended, why don't you look into tech? No idea mm -hmm. what that meant at the time. Um, and so I just started exploring and seeing what um, options there were, what, what tech meant, what healthcare tech or digital health meant. And um, I think now it's a, a lot more flushed out. And I think you can't, you probably can't find a single person who doesn't know what digital health is mm -hmm. um, at this point in time. But back then there wasn't a ton out there. Um, mm. so you know, doing a lot of research and talking to um, a few companies. And that is sort of what landed me um, into uh, into my first startup, which, you know, wasn't sure what that journey was going to take, um, take me on, but just was really willing and open to leaving a very comfortable um, lifestyle, everything that I was trained to do um, to kind of just be open and explore 
with this new possibility um, would take me. And since, you know, I, I had this license, I always knew I could go back. Um, yeah. So that was, you know, definitely a, a security blanket. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, speaking, you know, that what you just mentioned was a really great segue about some of the things that you kind of had to consider, you know, as a former clinician, what were some of, you know, either the challenges or the barriers that you faced when transitioning, you know, into a role in tech outside of the clinical setting? Um, and what did you do to overcome some of those? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the biggest barriers is just understanding, you know, you come when you're trained in these types of programs, um, I can speak directly from a pharmacy perspective, but pretty tangential to, um, you know, medical school or dental school or, you know, across the, um, mm -hmm. you know, those programs, um, you're really trained to be and excel at a specific thing. So in my case, really trained um, to understand drugs, diseases, how that interacts, how to interact with patients, how to interact um, with physicians and nurses and, you know, various other members of the healthcare system, but not so much um, how to interact with in the business setting. Um, mm, so some of the mm -hmm. skills um, coming into a business environment are things that I really struggled with pretty early in my career. Um, understanding, you know, that yes, there's politics in healthcare, um, but kind of understanding those business types politics and understanding like how to it, figure out my way um, with everybody else. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that was a really big struggle for me. I think programs now, there's like definitely an emphasis on more of those. Um, a lot of a lot of pharmacists, even medical students, they are you know do dual programs um, with MPH or MBA and you know get some of those softer skills. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, that's a really big challenge. And then even um, kind of imagining what a life would be. It was cool the first like year or two, um, but then a decision point of do I stay? What does that look like? What does that mean? Even understanding that landscape um, and what career growth and career trajectory looks like um, outside of you know everything that I had been taught. Um, uh, so that I think those were the, the biggest challenges um, that I came across and to overcome them. I don't know, to be honest, if I've totally overcome it. I think that it's, I feel, you know, definitely more secure and more confident of where I am in my, you know, the choices that I've made and where mm -hmm. I've landed. Um, but, you know, even I think there's still, I, I mean, it, what is the next level? I don't know. Um, you mm -hmm. know, and so I, if that's something that I'm hoping, you know, with more time, there'll be more answers that surface. But just really, I've been able to a lot, like find people that I have come across either in my personal life or, you know, people that I've worked with or just people across, you know, coming to talks like this that I yeah. feel like I could really align with um, and connecting with them and seeing how they've gone through their journeys and seeing where I can kind of not necessarily follow them in that direction, but see some of the lessons that they've learned um, and be able to apply those to my life. Yeah, absolutely. All about taking inspiration where you can find it. So I think that's great. Incredible. Um, and, you know, you, you kind of talk about a lot of the work that you've done and really, you know, the, the perspective that you are able to bring as a clinician. So would love if you can share a little bit more about, you know, some of the unique perspectives that, that you or other clinicians can really bring into, you know, the product um, setting within tech. Yeah. So, I mean, initially um, my value add was that I had content expertise. I worked at a mm -hmm. startup that was largely focused um, on oncology real world data. And I had, you know, spent so much time um, in oncology pharmacy practice. So there was like a pretty good one-to-one, -one, I can bring these drugs, regimens, and mm -hmm. kind of all this information to a, a team of technologists or business leaders um, that doesn't have, that didn't have that exposure. Um, mm -hmm. So that was, you know, the initial point of entry. Um, and I think one of the areas being in product, um, you're kind of a bridge between so many different groups internally, but then also externally to the customers. So something I've learned along, you know, this journey of the last couple companies that I've been at is that there is a perspective. Um, so a lot of these digital health tools clinicians are meant to use, right? Integrate within their um, practice or um, take the, the data that's within these tools and be able to apply them into their practice patterns or, you know, what, whether it be in a hospital or in a um, practice. Um, mm -hmm. And there is a pretty big divide and in what their knowledge content is, again, kind of going back to how they were taught and how they were trained yeah. um, and introducing all this new technology. Um, and so what I've, um, you know, kind of learned is just having been in clinical practice and understanding how physicians think, um, bringing that perspective. And when I'm making product decisions or thinking about products, 
um, deploying certain features, um, kind of putting my perspective, my, my me in their shoes. Like, how mm -hmm. would I think, how would I use this? Would this actually be useful? And I think that is um, a perspective that's been really helpful. Um, I guess it's an a, a, a extension of empathy, right? Empathy for the yeah. user. Um, and that's, I think, what any, you know, I'm not trained as a physician, but I can, I've worked with physicians and I can kind of see if this is going to be useful for them or not. Um, and I think Absolutely. that's yeah, I mean, I love what you're talking about, about how, you know, you're in a unique position to really see what an end user experience is like, kind of going back on your training and how you, in essence, were that end user at, at some point in your career. Um, so I think that, like, that connection um, sounds very valuable, you know, to, to a product team. Um, so on that note, um, how can founders and product teams, you know, incorporate more of this clinician insight into their process? You know, what does something um, like that type of, uh, communication look like? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of companies now, like there's, a, especially with the last couple of years with so much you know, money going into digital health, um, a lot of, you know, founding teams do incorporate, uh, chief medical officers or medical directors, which is great. Cause there's always, um, you know, good to have that medical perspective one from just, is this a medically accurate? Are we, you know, how, how are we um, building and deploying this? Um, is it medically accurate? Mm -hmm. Um, but then also, you know, kind of on a higher level strategy of how to look to, you know, monetize or commercialize this particular product. Um, but I think there's definitely cases to be made for incorporating um, more uh, folks with clin clinical degrees. So MDs, mm -hmm. RDs, you know, kind of NPs, RNs um, into product teams or, um, you know, teams that are, that sit near um, product as like advisors to kind of just be that in-house user testing base Mm -hmm. um, before it, you know, the, either the product hits the market, um, or even when it's out there, like deploying features. And I think what's really important to understand is that not, you know, any one group that you talk to, um, whether it be through user research, user research, or, you know, the teams within your own organization, it's not super representative of, you know, the entire, um, all the clinicians out there. And so yeah. trying to figure out the segments that you're really trying to target, um, and trying to create cohorts um, of users within that that just represent the diversity of that, whether that be the geography in which they're practicing or, you know, the level at which they're practicing. Um, mm -hmm. I think those things are the important things to incorporate when you're trying to figure out which users are actually um, will can optimize this product. Absolutely. So it's kind of like finding, you know, different variables within that clinician base. Um, to make sure that you're getting like the most accurate representation of what an end user would look like. Yeah, it's not like a monolithic thing, right? It's, you mm -hmm. know, it's better to be, um, just even in terms of patient populations, kind of looking at it that way, right? So um, yeah. I, I'm in the Bay Area. So the patient population here is definitely going to be different than, you know, a patient population out in Texas. So therefore, the physicians and clinical staff will be dealing with how they approach um, practice management. Um, and patient care will inherently be different, even though the guidelines are the same, you know, across the country. Um, and so I think those are things to keep in mind um, when uh, either building or building the product or, you know, deploying different features. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And kind of on that note, you know, when should founding teams or, um, you know, teams in general kind of start to look for some of those clinician team members um, is that something that is of importance, you know, pre-revenue kind of in the ideation phase? Um, is there a specific point where, you know, that should be a priority for them to incorporate as um, employees, advisors, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think employees will definitely kind of, um, depending on what your um, your growth stage is, you know, what your capital is. Um, but as advisors, I would say as early as possible um, mm -hmm. and bringing them in. And even if it's, um, even before our product is built, before user testing, really in that high level ideation of does this even have legs um i, I would definitely incorporate um you know any sort of clinical advisors that you could have um as early in the process as possible yeah absolutely um so for those that you know are maybe in a more clinical role that is kind of looking to break into tech um you know would love if you could share you know what what are some good next steps for them to kind of number one get a sense for you know where in tech is that such a huge space, um, you know, how did you kind of find out what, what you liked and what are some good next steps for them um, to kind of, you know, make that transition the way that you made that transition? 
Yeah, I mean, there's so many boards out there now and so many different organizations that focus on this. I know there's a lot in the pharmacy world itself. Um, there's not mm -hmm. a whole lot of us that, um, you know, went into um, the tech world or or yet. There, I'm sure there will be in the future. <laughs> or, you know, specifically in product, um, but there are, you know, groups out there that are happy to connect and share their experiences. Um, I know there's, I, and I know the people that I um, speak to are very eager to get more, um, at least on that end, the, like pharmacists um, into, um, not out of the clinical world, but kind of figure out a way to get folks that have really good clinical experience into this, these types of um, product roles. Um, so there's a lot of groups out there um, that you can connect with. Um, I would say, I very good at LinkedIn, stocking, researching. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So um, companies that I am interested in, um, every time that I'm looking for a job or you know looking towards my next step, look at the companies that I'm interested in, kind of go through the people there and see you know whose career path is maybe not one to one with me, but most in line, and reach out with reach out to them and just start having conversations. Um, I know a lot of people say this, but I think it's definitely true that more often than not, people are more than willing to talk. Um, mm -hmm. and share their experiences um, free of charge. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, nothing, no harm in a little bit of LinkedIn stalking. I think that's great. <laughs> awesome. Um, so we actually have some uh, questions from our audience. Um, so I'll just kind of dive in here. So you have a question, um, and I love that, you know, you have been on both sides from tech to kind of the hospital and the, the clinical setting. Um, so you have a question that says, what challenges do hospitals face in, you know, the acceptance of digital health products and solutions, especially, you know, now they're becoming so much more um, prevalent during this time? Yeah, I think the, um, the adoption piece of it. So I guess there's two, like one being able to even sell into it. Hospitals have just a, um, their, um, to kind of get into their, uh, um, cycle is pretty hard. Um, so by the time you're actually in, um, it'll be six to eight months after you start having those conversations. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the biggest piece is the adoption. Um, when I've worked with hospitals, physicians within the hospitals, trust um, in the product, uh, trust mm -hmm. in, especially if it's a, you know, a clinical insights or a data product, um, being able to trust what's in there. And so Initial, that initial piece of it is not just kind of walking in there and saying, here, we're going to solve all your problems. It's really just building a rapport um, and building conversations and dialogues and relationships with the physicians for them to be able to understand how this tool is really going to help them, um, taking mm -hmm. the time to understand what their, what their current workflow is. Um, a lot of, you know, physicians have so many apps and so many um, programs like EHRs or other tools that they have to sign mm -hmm. into and they have to kind of incorporate into their um, daily workflow. Um, so figuring out, you know, really what that looks like and where this tool can fall into that without being more overhead for them, I think is um, the hardest part um, to mm -hmm. start that, uh, that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have another question. What are your current goals in product development kind of with regards to um, you know, greater commercial acceptance um, and some of that adoption as well. Yeah, so I um, just recently actually started my role at uh, Rune Lab. So I think, um, so my background in, in the product space has largely been building data products. Um, so mm -hmm. for different user bases, um, but one of the reasons why I found it exciting for this particular opportunity at Rune um, was that taking all of that data, I've seen taking all that data and just kind of throwing it out people, it doesn't really help. Like it's great <laughs> data, but you know, if you don't teach them how to use it and really optimize um, the tool and the data and um, it's not really, you know, going to go that far. Um, mm -hmm. So rule, th this role at Rune, um, I'm looking forward to because I could take all of that data experience and, you know, we have teams working on um, data uh, but I get to kind of engage on that physician side and uh, and patient side and kind of take yeah. that data and really figure out um, how to make it useful for them. Um, so I'm really uh, excited to kind of fuse the two. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love what you said about how, <laughs> you know, throwing data it can sometimes, you know, make things a little bit, little bit more overwhelming um, yeah. than you would definitely want as a product company. Yeah, absolutely. All right, awesome. So we have another question um, from the audience. 
kind of, I guess, speaking to the design component, how do you design health products for diverse patient populations and users who may experience different barriers to tech access? Yeah, great question. I don't think I have a total answer to that. Um, I think um, working in terms of the actual design of the product and the functionality of you know, the tool itself, working very closely with designers that understand that um, and understand and like ha have great empathy for, for that user on the patient side. Um, the work that we're doing right now um, at my company is largely around um, patients with um, some neural disorders. So our first um, or our largest um, uh, therapeutic area right now is, is within the Parkinson's space and our, we have a, um, a patient tool um, so I don't know that I have a ton of answers right now on that, but I'm really looking forward to understanding some of the dynamics of, you know, just from being able to hold your phone when you have um, tremors, like how that impacts that user experience. Um, but kind of surrounding, I would say, surrounding yourself around people who have um, uh, skill sets to supplement, so designers and user researchers, um, and then, you know, definitely getting that inside of the patients um, directly uh, from those diverse sets of patients, um, and then hopefully coming up with a good solution. Awesome. And well, don't worry, we'll bring Kieran back on um, so that she can share what she's learned at <laughs> this new role as well. Um, that's incredible. And um, question, not from the audience, more from me, but would love to learn, you know, from your experience, um, you know, being kind of in this clinician space, what are some areas of opportunity that you see that can really benefit from, you know, digital health, tech disruption, et cetera? Yeah, I think definitely workflow management. Um, and I know there's a lot of companies out there trying to um, automate some of these, um, the, the swivel chair of, you know, whether it be clinicians or um, staff um, at the practices that are, are um, administrators at the hospital that kind of have to just go in between different um, um, programs uh, from especially kind of extracting data from the HR and kind of inputting it into another program, um, some automation around that. Um, mm -hmm. There's um, a, a lot of, I don't know that there's a total solution out there yet, but, and I know there's a lot of companies in the space working on it, but being able to integrate into EMRs a little bit more um, mm -hmm. uh, better than what's out there now. Um, I, as I mentioned, I've done a lot of work in data products and I've been in the EMR integration world and trying to connect one tool to and pulling out and extracting um, uh, data from the EMRs and it's not great, um, but I know there's companies out there working on that. So I think that's also a great um, space uh, to be yeah. in. Awesome. It's a lot of like the operational, um, making things a little bit easier to pull from all of these different um, data sources that, you know, a clinician would typically use. Yeah. And then like with devices, um, there's all the, uh, which is sort of in the space that I'm in now, um, how to take data out of devices and really, um, whether mm. that be, you know, there's the whole remote home monitoring now, other medical devices out there ext extracting um, data from that and integrating that into routine clinical care, um, which is a little bit more broad than the other first two that I had mentioned, um, but that's definitely a big area, um, especially with the growth in like remote home monitoring tools and um, the expansion of different medical devices. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Um, we have one more question that I see um, that we can ask. Uh, the last one would be, what is the best approach to reach out to hospitals and practices to introduce your service or product? Yeah, it's a little tough, but I would, um, I think, finding physician advocates, um, mm -hmm. they may not be the one signing the checks, um, but creating advocates out of your um, of your product um, mm -hmm. will definitely kind of help the checks kind of get signed mm -hmm. at the end of every year. Um, so we definitely find physicians uh, that are looking um, for solutions within that product. So if you're focused on um, cardiology, find cardiologists that you know are experiencing a pain point and really kind of have them understand your product and see the value of that product within their organization. Um, or if you're you know in oncology, the same mm -hmm. as there. I really find those those advocates. Awesome, great, great answer. Um, and so we typically end um, our conversation with our one last question, which is, um, do you have any words of wisdom for our audience, anyone that is interested in health tech? It could either be um, advice that you have or maybe advice that you've heard that you've kind of held on to from others. Um, would love if you can share that with us. 
Yeah, I mean, I think overall, like the, just reach out to people, have the conversations. Um, but I think for me, what has been, you know, what I've been told, but also what I've experienced is just continuous, continue to be curious um, and be open to wherever the journey takes you. It's, you know, I'm pretty A-type, so it's not always easy for me to just sort of <laughs> walk over the parameters of life. But um, I think that if you just um, embrace the change and embrace sort of the ambiguity, um, mm -hmm. that'll lead to a lot of uh, good things. And I think that's a continuous thing because I still have to tell myself that every most days. <laughs> I love that. Embrace the change. Words to live by. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for this amazing conversation, Karen. I think, uh, you know, just you being able to share your perspective um, has really, um, I would say, enlightened us all. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right. So um, please, everyone, join us t uh, next week for our conversation for the next Women's Health Tech Wednesday. Um, and then also, don't know if there's any other announcements, but please be sure to um, stay in touch with us on social media to find out about all of our other Women's Health Tech Wednesday episodes and any other Hit Lab events. Wanted to give one last huge shout out to our guest. Thank you so much, Karen. I uh, really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. And wanted to also thank our sponsors, Goodwin and Witham, for sponsoring this conversation. And with that, I'll say have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you so much for attending, and we'll see you next week. Bye.